So hello everybody. I wish you a very nice afternoon uh, to our guided tour through the first part of our Digital Treasures exhibition. Uh, we are talking today about the project that's currently going on and it's called Digital Treasures. And ah, there's somebody, somebody. So, uh, once more, be warmly welcome to our guided tour through digital treasures. Um, I would like to show you a part of an exhibition that's shown that's been shown uh, throughout Europe uh, the past two or three years, and currently, one part of the exhibition is uh, carried out in St. Pölten in Lower Austria. And today, I would like to introduce you into the first part of of the exhibition. It's about uh, the construction of Europe, unity and diversity. But uh, before we start to go through the exhibition, uh, I'd like to introduce you to the, the project in general. Uh, the, the basic of the project is that uh, it deals with, uh, it deals with uh, European archives and we think that European archives are fundamental primary resources for discovering and reinforcing the shared European culture and history. So that's the philosophical uh, fundament of, of our project. And uh, the project aims at bringing the joint European heritage and especially its digital versions, major visibility, outreach and use. And first and the main, focus of the project, so to speak, is to address the challenges of the digital society related to the management and the transmission of European histor historical and documentary heritage. The project consortium is uh, uh, formed by seven institutions from all over Europe, the project lead are the Spanish State Archives and the participants with uh, the various tasks within the project are the Cork Institute of Technology, it's Icarus, and the National Archives of Hungary, Malta, Norway, and Portugal. What are the aims of the project in general? It's not just to carry out an exhibition, it's uh, to find new paths how, uh, Euro how European archives could deal with a changing digital world in the future. So this means to develop new business models. This means also to address the, the, the question, how can archives amplify the visibility of the documents how can archives reach out to new audiences and how can archives support the transnational mobility of uh, stakeholders within the archives but also within uh, with uh, people from from other scientific and and economic fields like industrial designers also to find ways how archival documents can be reused in creative industries, for instance. And so the exhibition that I'm going to show you is one part of, of the project and it's been traveling around Europe. And uh, before we uh, go into the, the, the first part of the exhibition, I would like to show you our video.
got uh, some kind of impression what uh, our exhibition is about. As I've mentioned, the exhibition is uh, divided into three parts. Um, the first part that I'm going to introduce you today is about the construction of Europe, history, memory and myth of Europeanness over a thousand years. The second part of the exhibition deals with exiles, migratory flows and solidarity. Uh, it will be presented next week and the week after next week, the third part will be presented. It will be about European discoveries from the new world to new technologies. Um, the main principle of the exhibition is that various documents were selected from uh, various ar European archives and composed to uh, an exhibition with various topics. Now I would like to give you an impression of our first exhibition uh, about the construction of Europe. This exhibition uh, tells the story of Europe along with its construction as a concept that has changed over time. Created and shaped by the people who lived there, it also provides a collective identity for its inhabitants. Europe appeared sometimes in the image of unity, sometimes in that of diversity. Of course, its designated geographical boundaries existed, but Europe has no borders in an intellectual sense. Every attempt to draw a border was also a matter of power and politics at that time. Those that separated Eastern and Western Europe or Northern and Southern Europe from each other or indeed those that separated Europe sharply from other parts of the world. History of Europe is also fluid, constantly changing over time. Today, a comprehensive view of Europe also requires us to confront a history of colonialism, dictatorship, exclusion and genocides. It should recognize minority voices and their point of view from within Europe, along with the contribution of non-Europeans. In this way, we can understand diversity as the basis of European unity. The Exhibition number one is divided, is grouped into four pillars. And the first pillar is about the spirit of Europe. And it shows various documents from European archives about medieval love songs, Seneca's influence in the Middle Ages, a grant of arms confirming a nobility or a fragment of an alchemist manual or uh, a document about Fritjof Nansen, a polar pioneer, or also something about more modern, like the founding of modern meteor meteorology or Edward Monk's last will. So the variety of documents shown there is really huge and in, in order to tease you a little bit, uh, I've selected one document that I would like to show you. It's a document from the Czech National Archives from the year 1608. And it's about the alchem alchemical laboratory of Emperor Rudolf II. This document you see here in, in the writing is very typical for that time, the beginning of the 17th century. It's written in, in Czech language. And the document is, is really interesting because it uh, details some of the ingredients used in the practice of alchemy at this time. So including wipers, roses, the moss from bones found around gallows. So really, really strange for uh, us today. What's the background? Uh, Emperor Rudolf II, he was also King of Hungary, Croatia and of course of Bohemia and he also the Archduke of Austria. And he was a really strong supporter of the arts along with astrology and alchemy, which were regarded as mainstream scientific methodologies during the Renaissance period and also the early Baroque uh, period. 
Europe's most famous alchemists, such as Edward Kelly or John Dee, they were invited to work in the Emperor's alchemical laboratory at the Prague Castle, where he lived. And also other notable scientists uh, attended Rudolf's court, such as, as John Kepler. Thanks to Rudolf's support, for instance, Kepler developed his famous three laws of planetary motion and a number of other scientific inventions linked to Rudolf II's court in Prague. The financial and material needs of Rudolf's uh, laboratory were governed by the Bohemian Department of the Court of Chamber, where also this document comes from. As this document shows, the Bohemian Chamber sent requests to city councillors and district officers of the Bohemian land for supplies of ingredients for the alchemical laboratory. And as I mentioned, these included wipers, moss from bones, scorsoneras, roses and droseras. The ingredients were used then by the alchemists for the creation of various medicines including the water of life, aqua vitae, which was at that time considered a powerful remedy as well as a key component in the production, production of whiskey and brandy. So a really, really interesting document from the Czech National Archives about an interesting aspect of history of science at the beginning of the 17th, 17th century. The second pillar of the exhibition deals with the diversity of Europe. And here we can see various documents uh, from, as we've seen it, from various archives. So medieval miniatures or thousand year old runes or a royal letter on the rescuing of Muslim uh, captives or as Sensors of Ottoman subordinates in Hungary, or a manuscript map of Charlottenburg, or also uh, some uh, documents about teaching in Sami language in Finland. Um, I've chosen here a document that is of a high uh, actual uh, political relevance. It's the so called Pro Finlandia uh, petition. It's a document that was produced in Finland in 1899 during the first period of that country's Russification. Uh, what's the background? Finland had been occupied by the Russian Empire since 1809, incorporated to the Empire as a Grand Duchy of Finland, granting it a degree of autonomy. Finland had before been part of Sweden uh, for centuries. While the Emperor of Russia was the Grand Duke of Finland then, he was represented there by the Governor General. And at the end of the 19th century, the Russification of Finland was an attempt by the Russian Empire also to limit Finland's autonomy and also to curtail its cultural uniqueness. It was part of the larger Russification policies of that time, which tried to assimilate the national and ethnic minorities of the Russian Empire. And so a petition was started against the February Manifesto of Tsar Nicholas II, which abolished language rights and Finnish autonomy. And then more than half a million signatures, this means 20% of the Finnish population of that time were collected within 11 days. The Tsar uh, refused to, uh, to accept the petition and so uh, a second uh, petition was started, the called, uh, it was called the Pro Finlandia. And it's, it's really highly remarkable because it consists of over a thousand signatures from prominent cultural figures across 12 European countries, including uh, famous artists like Emile Zola, Frederic Passy, Rudolf Virchow, Florence Nightingale, Laurent Erdwasch, Fritjof Nansen, Henrik Ibsen and A. E. Nordenskjöld. While the Tsar also refused to accept this petition, it stands as a 
prime example of the willingness across Europe to defend common values during this time of crisis. And in 1917, then, the Parliament of Finland adopted the Finnish Declaration of Independence, declaring it an independent nation state. So the pro Finlandia is something really remarkable and of highly current relevance. The third pillar of the exhibition deals with the multiple faces of Christianity. The history of Christianity in Europe as it interacted also with other religions and cultures illustrates the diversity of beliefs that helped shape Europeanism. This story in itself can symbolize the diversity of European history as well. Intolerance and tolerance, power or total rejection of power. In this part of the exhibition, we find documents like a codex on the pilgrimage of Santiago de Compostela or a medieval commentary of the apocalypse or a privilege charter for one of the most important monasteries in, in, in Bohemia. Something really, really interesting about the Holy Callis or uh, a private letter of the Diet of Augsburg in the time of confessionalism, or also something about the so-called Holy Right Hand. I've chosen a document uh, that deals with the Order of St. John. It's something like the founding charter of the Order of St. John. Here you see, uh, you see the document. It's a, a papal bull from the beginning of the 12th century. It's very typical uh, with its writing and, and here the mon monographs and, and all the other stuff. Um, here we see the, the papal bull. It's called in Latin Pie Postulatio Voluntatis, the most pious request. And it was issued by Pope Paschal II in 1113. It is issued in favor of the Hospital of St. John, today the Sovereign Military Order of St. John of Jerusalem. It really constituted a milestone in the history of the Hospital of St. John, as it carried the sought-after ecclesiastical approval for the new institution. Founded by Blessed Gerard in Jerusalem, probably around the middle of the 11th century. Around the year 1048, the Fatimid Caliph al Mustanzir Billa gave uh, permission to merchants from the Repub Republic of Amalfi to build a hospital in Jerusalem. Led by Blessed Jarrah, the community running the hospital became independent during the First Crusade around 1099 and was the origin of the Knights Hospital. This bull is considered by some scholars to be the founding charter of the hospital, transforming what was a community of pious men into an institution within the church. By virtue of this document, the Pope officially recognized the new organization as an integral and operative part of the Roman Catholic Church. He formally recognized the foundation of the hospital which became a lay religious order under the sole patronage of the church. So the bull also gave the order the right to elect its grandmasters without interference from external authorities. The bull includes a list of the order's hospitals and hospices in France and Italy, indicating it already had a European dimension and was not just limited to the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. So, in some sense, it's also some kind of founding charter of trans-European networks. Now let's switch to the fourth pillar of our exhibition. It's about the heritage of enlightenment. I think uh, enlightenment is something really, really important for Europe because everything uh, of a modern uh, order, a political order and democracy, I think it's, it's built on enlightenment. 
Here in this part of the exhibition, we have uh, documents like uh, a lawful charter regarding African slaves. We have a Masonic uh, certification of a Chevalier de Lincel, or we have a document about the abolition of torture issued by Maria Theresia of Austria, or also the patent of tolerance issued by Emperor Joseph II. Since we've seen uh, a lot of old documents so far, I've chosen here a newer document. It's an, an, a picture, a photo from the National Archives of Norway, and it deals with uh, the voting rights for no Norwegian women. The photo here you, you can see is from a meeting held in the old ballroom at the University of Oslo between June the 3rd and 7th in 1902. The meeting was concerned with the voting rights of Norwegian women, the key demand of the suffragette movement since the turn of the century. In the picture on the left, Mrs. Friederike Marie Kwam addresses the meeting of 500 people. She was the leader of the Norwegian Women's Public Health Association, the organizers of the meeting. The association was founded in 1884 to safeguard women's rights and strive for an inclusive society through the voluntary activities of its members. Important figures behind the association included Gina Krog, voting advocate and left-wing politician, and Hagbard Berner, the parliamentary represent representative for the left-wing Liberal Party. After female voting rights in national elections were achieved in 1913, they worked to improve women's political participation and for greater gender equality in school, education and working life. So Norway was one of the first countries in the world to introduce female voting rights in national elections. So New Zealand was the first in 1893, Finland was the only country in Europe to do so before Norway in 1906, and Denmark introduced women's suffrage in 1950, with many other countries following suit in the years around the end of World War I. The United Nations supported the introduction of women's voting rights following World War II, so the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women defined it as a basic right within its 189 member countries. So we see it was a really long lasting pro process uh, to gain equal rights for women, not ending with granting them the voting rights, but also many other rights. Um, Europe is history, is tradition, it's a collective memory as we see in all those documents. It is not indifferent to how we remember historical events presenting the tragic moments as well. And this exhibition would like to show such a construction of Europeanism that Today, anybody, regardless of birth, origin, nationality, religion, can identify with, taking her on and considering her own identities as part of Europeanism as well. Part of the exhibitions are also computer games. Um, within the exhibitions shown, you can play these games. But if you go to the Digital Treasures website, there you can download all the uh, video games and play them yourself on your computer. So here you have a screenshot of the page uh, containing all the links for downloading the video games. If you want to see the entire exhibition, uh, it's very easy to download uh, the entire catalog with all the documents and all the descriptions from our website. Or as a 
Icarus or Icarus for All member, we have a special offer for you. We would like to send you your free hard copies uh, via mail. Uh, so it does not cost anything. You just need to drop an email to Tatiana Hölzl and she will send you your free uh, hard copies of the catalog where you can also leave through the printed book. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you uh, uh, much pleasure and, and, and fun with our catalogs in the history, in the digital treasure, uh, with the <laughs> digital treasures exhibition. Thank you very much. So, maybe there are any questions. Today we have the, 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 the chief curator of the, of the exhibition with us. It's, it's Karl Heinz. So maybe Karl, you would like to, to add something. Maybe I've, I've missed something to say. Well, I think it was a good summary of, of the first part um, of the exhibition. Um, uh, it's um, so you mentioned that next week will be the second part and in two weeks the third part so it's a series of, of lectures and uh, don't miss to uh, to uh, catch up with them uh, the the next ones will be done the English versions done by colleagues from Portugal and Norway who were mainly responsible for the design and the content uh, with of these exhibitions. So the, fr the three um, exhibitions are to be seen as a whole, uh, as, a, as a unit um, featuring uh, different aspects of, of Europe. And I think the first one, the construction of Europe, especially to show what Europe actually is, is a good starting point in this topic. Thank you very much, Carl. So, I've put uh, the, the link and also Tatiana's email address in, into the chat. So if you want to order your, your free copies uh, of, of the catalog, please just drop her an email. And I wish you a wonderful evening and thank you very much for attending our guided tour today.